Whether you're watching live or you're here with me, and if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 19, we are going to read the full chapter, and it's a powerful one, as all scripture is, but I especially love Revelation 19, so if you would read with me. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heavens crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come! Gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who is in, who in its presence has done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the word of the Lord, and I believe it. I'd like to take uh, just a quick moment before we, we sing some songs just to uh, to pray a little bit. The Lord's really been speaking to my heart this morning, so a little more prayer, hopefully, on the line. Uh, and it gives a chance for our, our, our online folks to join their hearts with us as well. So, Father God, we just want to come to you one more time today and say we need you. We need so much to be rooted in your truth and in your love. 
we all of your church father whether they're here in this room whether they're listening to our voice whether they are just gathering in small groups somewhere else or in large congregations father god more now more than ever we need leadership both in our nation and in the nations around the world to stand in truth so many people are making decisions based on fear and we need to be so sure that we are standing in your truth and in your love and that we will boldly speak your word and lift you up. So Father God, we just, once again, we voice our commitment to be your heart, to be your hands and your feet here, both in this nation and the nations around the world, that we would stand together and boldly speak your truth. We ask for your strength and your wisdom and your guidance in these days in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're uh, gonna start with painful one this morning.
The song we just sang, the song we listened to, the, the video clip, really is, I mean, those words are just, uh, they're just so powerful. And they, 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 they blend right into our text this morning. And uh, great to see you guys here. Yeah. Some car trouble on the way in here. Glad to see you here. It's really good to be back. It's really good to be back and uh, to fellowship with you all this morning. Special welcome to you who are joining with us online. We pray that this experience of worship and word would be touching your souls this morning. And so, Lord, we, as we come this morning to, to worship and now look into your word, as we've had already been singing and listening, pondering in worship, we pray that you would... Help us engage that part of us that requires sometimes a little bit of energy and, and work to think and to reflect on your words. Sometimes your word is mysterious and it's difficult to understand and to know how to apply to our lives. And so we ask the aid, the anointing of your Holy Spirit again in this way as we look into your ancient, holy and inherent and life-giving word this morning. In Jesus' name. So for those of you who are visiting with us this morning, what we have been doing is we've been journeying through the book of Revelation, and we find ourselves in chapter 19 this morning. And we're going to be finishing, wrapping this up in about four weeks, and so that gives us a bit of a timeline for you to set your eyes to, and we'll be looking at something completely different uh, in about four weeks' time. But today we pick up the prophecy in chapter 19, and from this point forward, all of the history is beginning to come to a close, and a new chapter of eternity is approaching it. We're projecting ourselves, as the scripture does, at a certain point in time in the future. There's an eternity approaching, and things are starting to pick up very quickly in terms of things that we see will happen if we're the generation living on the earth at that time. In early July, we saw in chapter 17 and 18 that in the future, the world system, its economics, its politics, its power, its influence, education, lust, greed, injustice, and oppression, all of it that's opposed to Jesus and his followers fall, falls and crumbles. That's Babylon. And in chapter 19, we read immediately, as we're going to read in, a few, in, in just a moment, but we read immediately four hallelujahs that are proclaimed. And when a hallelujah was proclaimed in the ancient world and is now, when you hear people proclaim hallelujah, really what they're voicing, what they're proclaiming is it's a cry of joy. It's not, it's not kind of soft. It's, it's an exuberant cry of joy. That's what hallelujah meant and means today. And here in this passage we're going to read, it's going to come from a vast multitude and from elders at that time. And the reason for this celebration is because true and justice are his judgments. True and just are his judgments. God's justice is true because it's based on his own covenant faithfulness. And it's just because it's based on his moral character. In other words, his judgments are morally true and legally just. And so there's four hallelujahs that are proclaimed because true and just are your judgments, O Lord. Let's pick it up at the beginning of the chapter. I don't have all of this on the slide. We're going to move Fairly, move fairly quickly through it, and I pick up some of these on the slides in a few minutes. If you have your Bibles with you, which I encourage you always to do if you have your Bibles, to bring them with you, uh, then you can follow along. But we have some of them on the slides because there is a fair bit of text this morning. So we'll pick it up at verse 1. You can just listen and follow along. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute. Now, the great prostitute is the, the image that we read about earlier that is the evil world system that has murdered and oppressed the church of Jesus Christ, his kids, his children, his followers, the church, who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Again, they shouted, verse 3, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now this smoke of torment that's going up forever and ever is in direct contrast to other smoke we read of in Revelation. The smoke of incense, for example, that's mingled in and with the prayers of the saints. If you were journeying with us in chapter 8, there's prayers of the saints and smoke is mingled with it as it goes up before God. 
very different also than the smoke of the glory of God that filled the temple in chapter 15, verse 8. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting. And here we hear the fourth time, Hallelujah, for the, our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. This is a great meal at the end of the age where Jesus will sit down and eat with us and us with him. This is the meal, the great meal, the great invitation Jesus referred to when he said to his disciples as he ate his last supper with them, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We read it sometimes, oftentimes, during our time when we celebrate the Lord's table, communion. Jesus sitting around with his disciples, the last supper, he says, keep doing this until I come because one day when I return, we're going to eat together. Verse 10, at this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So what's going on is that John's, what John is experiencing here is so incredible. He's tempted. He thinks this is God. It just can't get any more incredible. And so he's, he's, he's drawn to worship this being. And this, he's tempted to, but he's immediately prohibited from doing so. You only worship God. And that angel is not God, a created creature. Now, what we're going to read from here on in, and this is we're going to spend where we're going to spend the majority of our time. What we're going to read from here on in is the most powerful, one of the most powerful portrayals of Jesus ever written. As we read in chapters five, five to six, it begins with him as the Lamb, who is the conquering Ram, but at the same time, the conqueror is the bridegroom, the Ram, the conquering Lamb, but at the same time as the bridegroom. So we see in Revelation, these images are intense. They, they, they're just so vast and they in, are interchangeable in some of these, these chapters. We just have to sit back sometimes and just soak it in. Rather than overanalyze, we just soak it in. Ponder it, gaze at it, let it go into our souls. Isn't that what artists do? Isn't that what you do with true beauty? You don't overanalyze it, it's not a book. You, you take it in. You are amazed. You gaze at it. You let it soak into your heart and your mind. You let it transform your being. That's what we do with true beauty when we're stunned by true beauty. Amen. The imagery we're going to read here and absorb here almost feel like it boils at a high heat. And we, the reader, can barely keep up with it. You may feel that as we go through this. What we're going to see is that as a conqueror, Jesus rides on a white horse. And as the just conqueror, he's also faithful. His name, in one sense, is unknown. In another sense, it's the word of God. And still, in another sense, it's written on his thigh. He destroys with the sword of judgment. He wields with the shepherd's club. And at the same time, he treads God's wine press of wrath. Most of all, the great end times battle of Armageddon for which the book has prepared for us since chapter 16, 14, never really happens. Lots of activity, lots of planning on the part of humanity and a part of the devil and his evil angels, the false prophets, but it never gets off the ground. What we see instead is that the armies, and we're going to see some of this in chapter 20, the armies of the great beast gather to fight, but no battle takes place. The sword comes out of Jesus' mouth and immediately armed, the armies are no more. The beast and the false prophet are the first of three groups to be cast into the lake of fire. Satan, death, and Hades make up the other groups. And the armies are killed and await final judgment. Let's read it. I have some of it on the screen for you. Picking it up in verse 11. 
And I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. Verse 11. The writer's titles as faithful and true identify him of Jesus as Jesus and faithful and true, the faithful and true witness we read about in the opening chapter, verses 1 5 and 3 14. Verse 12 His eyes are a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows of but himself. Verse 13 He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on, a, on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword to which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads in the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God. Now the imagery here is really, really intense. It maybe should have a little caption like you read, you have before you watch a movie of, of, of what, what level this is. This is very intense. An angel sees birds flying overhead and announces to the birds, Come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. So we need to ask now, what is the great supper of God? This is not the marriage supper of the Lamb that we just read about. This is a different meal. This supper of God was going to happen at the angel's invitation for birds to pick the corpses of the beast's army clean at the last battle. This reflects an Old Testament covenant curse in Deuteronomy 28. And is an echo of God's prophetic word against Gog and Magog, which we're going to read about in the next chapter, but also talked about in Ezekiel 39. And also in the next chapter, we're going to read more about them. Gog and Magog assembling together for the last battle. Verse 19, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he deluded those who received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. See, if you've been journeying through Revelation, you've, you've gone through, you go through, through levels of, of grief and sadness and perhaps even some fear and intensity as we watched and read the beast and the false prophet introduce the mark of the beast and those who are not taking that mark will be killed. Things have turned now. Now it's the false, it's the beast and the false prophet who will be captured and could have thrown into the lake of fire. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And that's pretty intense imagery, isn't it? I'd like to spend just a few minutes now just walking through this, talking about it, what it means for you and I this week. I believe 150% uh, that all of Scripture is meant for the edification of our lives. It's meant to fill our, our, our being with spiritual food. It's meant to serve as a roadmap for the future as we walk through this world. It's also meant for a light for the path to know what is going to happen, some in some cases in advance, prophetic. But I believe first and foremost that it has to somehow apply to our lives. I believe that is the primary number one intent of scripture. It's infallible, it's beyond reproof, beyond correction, it's mysterious, but it is meant to shape our lives. Amen. It's, not, it's not meant for a library, it is not meant for a museum, it's not meant for just good information, but it's meant to transform our lives. Amen. At the end of the age, Jesus will not ask us if he ever does. He will not ask us, did you memorize that passage in Greek for me? He, did, he won't ask us, so, so uh, how much did you analyze the syntax of the text? How many theology books did you read? 
He's going to ask us, if he ever does, I'm only speculating because we ask these kind of questions when we talk about this. Did you, did you live what I said? Did you take it to heart? Did you allow it to transform your heart and your mind? That's right. So what we're going to see from this text is that Jesus wins, and because Jesus wins, we win. Do you ever feel like you don't win? Do you ever feel like in this world that we live in now, everyone else is winning? The world is winning. The government is winning. All of the corruptness that you see in pop culture and the entertainment world is winning. It's captivating the hearts and minds of an entire generation. The gaming industry is winning. Power is winning. Money is winning. Greed and lust is winning. Oppression is winning. Injustice is winning. Isn't that what we read about? And in some, re in some ways, that's a reflection of reality. We're reading about it because it's happening. Yeah. Human trafficking is still happening in, in Alberta, in Canada. They're still finding people that are somehow finding ways to traffic young girls. But friends, Jesus wins. Amen. Right. And that has got to impact our life tomorrow. Jesus wins, first of all, because he's called faithful and true. John speaks of Jesus in this way in the beginning of Revelation, saying Jesus Christ in chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. Well, he's faithful to his Father from beginning to end. He's faithful from before the beginning to after the end. He is committed to his Father's will. He is faithful all the way to the cross. He is true. Amen. The word that John uses means reliable. Means Faithful means reliable. Or better yet, genuine. True in, in, in comparison to a fake. It's true. The genuine article, we would say, is the, is the real thing. That's right. Number two, we win because Jesus wins. Jesus wins because his eyes are a flame of fire. Eyes often give us away. Eyes are a lamp to the soul. We look into one another's eyes. Often we can sometimes get a sense of how things are doing in, in our souls. That's right. His eyes are a flame of fire. They're bright, they're pure, they're penetrating and purifying. And his eyes not only look at us, at us, but they look through us. No one can pull the wool over his eyes. He looks right into our face, right into the face of his enemies. At Jesus' gaze, everything is leveled. Number three, Jesus wins because upon his head are many diadems. On his head are many victories. Diadems, crowns, they're the symbols of victory. That's what a diadem is a symbol of, victory. That's right. So on his head are many victories. In fact, too many to count. It's a strange picture to be sure. Many crowns, many, many crowns on one head. But in the first century, it was not uncommon for a monarch to wear more than one crown in order to show that he was king of more than one country. When Jesus rides to the final battle, he rides having won many victories. What are these victories? I'm one of them. Yeah. You're one of them. Yeah. You're one of his victories. Hallelujah. Every human being who's walking with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we would say, is a diadem on his head. Every person whom Jesus has set free from the ultimate powers of sin, death, and evil is a diadem on his head. And so Jesus wins because upon his head are many diadems, many victories. Number four, Jesus wins because he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. What is this? The interesting thing to observe is just how many commentaries on Revelation go to just great lengths to, to try and figure out what his name is. And as the text says, no one knows except himself. What's he referring to? Two things. The text tells us no one knows except himself. So first in ancient times, it was thought that if you knew someone's name, and especially if you knew a God's name, you could exercise a certain level of control over that person, over control of him or her. Now when you think about it, to a degree that's true. For example, if you see your friend walking down the street ahead of you and you yell out, Tim, he's going to stop and turn around, hopefully. Or when you want to get your son's attention, you say their full name, Cash River Anderson. <laughs> a name which no one knows except himself, really, when you think about it. Yes, as parents, we gave him that name. 
but nobody knows what makes up that name, apart from God, of course, more than cash. It's a way of saying that Jesus Christ is as available as he has made himself to us, as compassionate as he is toward us, as passionate as he is for our wholeness, is under no one's control. Second, in ancient times, names revealed something about a person's nature and character. If you knew a person's name, you kind of almost had a mini personality profile of that person. The same is, is like it today. Recording in John chapter 1, Jesus sees the fisherman and says, You're Simon. A name related to the word for shifting sand, but you shall be called Cephas, the rock. A new name because of a new character trait. No one really knows the name except himself and God. Jesus has revealed himself to us and done so under many, many names. Lord, Savior, Son of God, Son of Man, Bread of Life, Light of the World, Faithful and True, and on it goes. But even as full as that revelation is, even as full as that revelation is, there is still more to be revealed. There's still more to discover about Jesus Christ. Yes. And the Apostle Paul, speaking of Jesus, said in 2 Corinthians 9.15, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. As much as Jesus has said about himself, there's always more to say. There's always more to say. As much as we know of him there's more to know and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and the bright morning star and on and on it goes but he has a name which no one knows except himself you know i love this i absolutely love this because there's i grew up i grew up in the church and, and there's a sense in which you're i know some of you may think you're still really young but you know, at 52 and you've grown up in the church, you, you can look back and you can see things, right? And, and you, you know, I remember, especially in the decade of the 90s, this was a time when the church, there was a, if you could say that the material coming out from the modern church in the West was, if you could say anything about it, many people have said that it was very, in a sense, humanistic. And so I grew up in a sense thinking that we had Jesus all figured out. People were looking at his parables and saying, oh, look at Jesus as a coach. He's in, look at it, the woman of the well. He's intending on saying this, and this is the reason he went and used this approach. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, no, no. Just sit down and marvel at Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't reduce him to a method. Do not reduce him to a principle of leadership or to a coach, for goodness sakes. Five, Jesus wins because he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. What a powerful picture this is. This is the big ticket image in the vision of Jesus' warrior. The robe he wears is dipped in blood. That's to say there's blood in his robe. And friends, there's blood on his robe before he ever comes to the final battle. His robe is stained with blood before he ever comes to the final battle. So we have to ask, what kind of blood is this? Whose blood is it? It, it, it's not blood from the battle. He comes to the battle with the blood already there. Friends, from the whole book of Revelation and from the whole of the New Testament, there's only one answer. The, the blood on his robe is his own. Yeah. Yeah, his robe, both a priest's robe and a king's robe, is stained with his own blood. Jesus, the warrior, rides to the final battle, which is never fought. Because he already fought it at the cross. His robe is already dipped in his own blood. This is explained, this explains why the armies of heaven which follow Jesus, he on a horse and they on horses are dressed in linen. If the enemies were joining him in battle to be fought, they would be dressed in soldiers' uniforms, but linen? Linen is the uniform of priests. Linen is the uniform of the bride. The armies of heaven joining the victory of Jesus the warrior by being priests, announcing and implementing the high priestly work of the king. Six, Jesus wins because as the text tells us in 1913, again, he is the word of God. Amen. Earlier in John, the Gospel of John 1, 1 to 18, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, without him not anything made that was made in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, but he was ranks before me, but he because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who was at the Father's side. He has made him known. That Jesus is the word of God, which means that Jesus is God's speech. Jesus is God's final speech, as the writer of the Hebrews says in 1, 1 to 2. The living God, invisible, transcendent, all-powerful, beyond description, God has spoken for himself. And his speech, his word, is Jesus. Amen. That's what it means to be Jesus being the word. And the word became flesh. God's speech became flesh. Yes, he was all he has existed eternally as God's son. Yes, but he is his speech also. I think John particularly had in mind this line that I read at the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. Friends, Jesus wins because he is the one who created all things. Yes. Who can possibly overcome him? As you reflect on your week, as you look at the week to come, who could possibly overcome him? Who's going to be able to overcome the creator of the universe? What political power, economic power, military, spiritual power? The dragon. The dragon was created by Jesus, was created by Jesus, first an angel, but became a dragon. What what power is going to overcome Jesus? Yes, now again, this is the issue that we need right now is the faith that we need because it always looks like he's not winning. That's why we need faith. Jesus wins because he is the word of God. And lastly, Jesus wins because on his robe and on his thigh he has name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Friends, every human being has a king. Jesse Ventura, the 38th governor of Minnesota from 1999 to 2003, said that he liked being king because there is no one over him. Sorry, Jesse. There is someone over you. Every king is a king. Jesus is king above all kings, governor above all governors. Every lord is a lord. Jesus is lord above all lords, kings and queens, lords and ladies. Presidents, prime ministers, premiers, governors and mayors may not realize it or acknowledge it or like it. But that doesn't change reality. There is someone who is lord over them. Yes. One may not be able to name the name of Jesus over the parliament building or in a public classroom, but that doesn't change reality. Jesus is king over the government building, is on every nation's capital. Jesus is Lord in every classroom. The only issue is whether or not we will face reality and surrender to him. Friends, Jesus wins simply because of who he is, faithful and true, eyes like a flame of fire, many diadems on one, one's head, a name no one knows except himself, clothed in a robe stained by his own blood, word of God, king of kings, lord of lords, the one whom no one can finally overcome or withstand. In this revelation vision, I really believe that Jesus is he's speaking to a great crisis facing the first century church as they live out their existence in a very oppressive Mediterranean region governed by the power of Rome. Who's going to win, Caesar, with all of his military power, or Jesus with his simple word? Who's going to win? The letter of revelation to Jesus Christ, I believe, was written to bring the first century church back to confidence in Jesus and his word and give them a roadmap for the future. And I also believe the church in our century is facing the same crisis. Yes, it is. I really do. Who's going to win, Caesar? All the powers? Caesar and all of his economic and technological power? 
or Jesus with his simple word? Are we a people that believe in Jesus just with his simple word? Amen. Is that who we are? Is that what our lives really are governed by? Jesus says the word and the pure power of that word. One pastor, Daryl Johnson, describes a mother who was panicked about her son being away at college, called him because she was frightened to death. It's dark out there at college, Daryl, she said. There's so much evil out there. Daryl speaking, I said to her, you've done a great job raising your son. He knows Jesus Christ. He wants to follow Jesus. You've prayed for him. You've covered him with the blood. You've handed him into Jesus' hands. Now let go. Trust Jesus. She spent another 10 minutes telling me how evil it is out there. I finally said to her, you think the darkness is greater than Jesus, don't you? No, I don't. Yes, you do. I could tell her that because that's how often I feel. Heaven's not a faraway place, way up there and way out there somewhere. Heaven is another dimension of reality, very close at hand. When John was given the revelation, Simply, a door opened, and he was taken into another dimension. So the one who rides out of heaven when it's open is not far away. He's not far up there, way out there. He's very close at hand, and any moment he can break through. And that's what apocalypse means, unveiling. The phrase, the second coming of Jesus Christ, does not mean that he's coming from a, a distant land, a distant place. He's near to us, right at the door, knocking, yeah. wanting to come in. That's right. And one day, he's going to simply pull back the curtain. He's going to make plain to the whole world what is true right now. And so I ask, I ask you, where are you at in your, in your faith this morning? As you observe the Delta variant and you, you look at the geopolitical tensions in our world, you look at the Taliban racing across the Middle East. You look at climate, climate issues aridity, heat, food shortages beginning. Friends, the Church of Jesus Christ needs to live out our existence now with our eyes wide open. Wide open. Wide open with our ears on the ground, seeing what's happening in our world. But more than anything, wide open. Hearts wide open, expansive to receive the love of Jesus Christ and to walk in that love with eyes full of faith. That's what he wants for us tomorrow. Yeah. And even when we leave here. So that's my prayer for us today. So Father, I would ask that you would help us do that. We don't know what the future holds, only you do. And we would ask, Lord, that you would help us yes. to walk full of faith. As we walk out this door today, there will be faith challenges, that, faith challenges that will present themselves to us that will come right at our door. There are things, be things that we see in society that we read in the news, watch, watch in the news. They will challenge our faith. Are you really winning? Open our hearts, make them fully alive. Open our eyes, make them fully alive to the power of your speech, your simple word, and why you, you're winning now, and you'll win in the future. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to uh, share in another song before we have coffee or the rest of our afternoon, whatever is coming for you? So you'll join us. This is a wonderful song, and we were just reading about the words.
I listened to that song over and over and over again this week in my office. Did it do something to you? Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. This week, in all things, at work, rest, and play. Amen. God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. Enjoy some coffee with us and some fellowship. And uh, God bless you as you go into a, another beautiful day.